Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, and also site of the latest in our series of virtual programs. We're very glad you could join us today. My name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the education department. And today we're very excited to have with us a former standout player, always entertaining storyteller, Rico Petroselli, longtime shortstop and third baseman for the Boston Red Sox two-time participant in the World Series. We are gonna be talking to Rico about his 2018 book, An All-Stars Cardboard Memories. And I have a copy of it, beautifully, a photograph book featuring baseball card images of Hall of Famers that Rico played with or against during the course of his career in the 60s and 70s. So we're very glad that Rico could join us for today's virtual author series. We will Welcome Rico momentarily. We do want to remind you that this program, along with all the others that we do, made possible through the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. And we do thank the Ford Motor Company for being our sponsor. Virtual author series, Rico Petroselli and All Stars Cardboard Memories. Rico, I'd mentioned to you that I interviewed you oh, about 25 years ago. You <laughs> were still working for the Boston Red Sox. Wow. And then I called you and I, I, I Caught you when you were in the sand trap. You were on the golf course. <laughs> I actually answered your phone. But we uh, were able to set things up. We do appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, how are you doing these days? Oh, very good. And uh, yeah, I didn't. Uh, it, I was in the sand trap, and I really didn't get out too successfully. But uh, that's all right. I had fun anyway playing golf. But things are going well. Thank God. Uh, you know, we're the family is healthy. My wife, myself. Children, grandchildren, and uh, uh, still enjoying baseball. Of course, the Red Sox guy. I uh, even though I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, but uh, I love the Red Sox, and we we live here. We have lived here since 1965. We see a cover of the uh, the book here, All Stars Cardboard Memories. Uh, you worked on this book with a number of other co-writers, Tom Zoppola, his wife Ellen, Joe Orlando, uh, Dr. Jim Lonborg, the former Red Sox ace, also uh, <laughs> contributed to the book as well. Uh, how did this idea come about? Uh, did you approach Tom? Did Tom approach you? I, I believe you've been friends for a while, but how did oh, yeah. it actually begin? Well, we were doing a uh, uh, collectible show, and uh, we before one of the shows, we went into the cafeteria and went talking and Tom came, said, you know, I got this idea. Let me run it by you. He said, you played against, against a lot of hall of famers and played with throughout your career, throughout the years that you were there. I said, would you be interested in maybe if we do a book about it? You have stories about these guys. I said, geez, that's a, you know, that's a pretty good idea. So Tom and Ellen, his wife was fabulous. Uh, they started researching and they, you know, they came up with the players that I played against and played with. And gee, we, and I was surprised. It was, I think over 50, 58, some, uh, something like that uh, of players. And the one thing, uh, Bruce, I'll tell you the, the thrill. And I look back is playing against these, some all time greats, whether it was spring training or during the season, all-star games, the world series, Wow. Uh, you know, I look up, look back at the photos that are in this book and say, man, I was fortunate not just only to play in the major leagues, but to see the Willie Mays, the Mickey Mantle, Hank Aarons, the Sandy Koufax in action, whether it was spring training or regular season, as I mentioned. And uh, wow. So I got excited. Uh, when Tom says, let's do it. I says, okay. <laughs> so he got the, he got the recorder out and we went on, you know, I don't know how long it took, but, uh, and then they, they put it together along with Joe Orlando, who's uh, a genius as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and uh, just came out with a beautiful book and I'm really happy with it. You know, a lot of people talk about the 1950s as the glory years of baseball, but I think of the 1960s and 70s as being at the same level. So many great players, so many great teams. And it was, you know, for the almost entirety of the 1960s, only one team could emerge as a champion from each league. So there were usually some great teams that didn't even get to the postseason during those years. Yeah. Uh, for those who are interested in the book, uh, we have it at our website. Go to shop.baseballhall.org. 
and then do a search for Rico Petroselli, the book will come up. And we do have signed copies of the book, uh, the book signed by Rico, the Zapalas, and I believe Joe Orlando as well. So all their signatures are there. And again, just get it at our website, shop.baseballhall.org, and then do the search for Rico Petroselli. And you can see the spelling right there. Rico, let's talk about those days growing up in Brooklyn. You were a Dodgers fan, but it was this guy. We see him with Ted Williams here. It was Mickey Mantle of the Yankees who became your boyhood hero. Why Why not a Dodger? Why do you think you gravitated to the Mick? Well, he was uh, – I mean, Mickey was – was different even in those days he hit some home runs that you know would be now i guess some of these these kids uh you know they're so big and strong they hitting 475 he he hit 475 to center field in the old yankee stadium was 463 and we saw him hit balls way over that uh you know, the fence, I mean, it had to be close to 500 feet. And then the one that he hit almost out of the ballpark, but he was that kind of player. He'd strike out a lot, but boy, he, he could hit. He was a clutch hitter, you know, uh, obviously a, a power hitter and he could run when he first came up. I, I, you were, you would be amazed. He'd hit a ground ball, to first base wide of first base. And the first base would catch it and he'd beat it out. That's how fast he was lifting and righty. A uh, great pop, probably a little more power right-handed. Mm. It's just a, and and a just a humble guy, you know. He was you never heard him boast or anything like that. Uh, just just wonderful. By the way, I I was the youngest of seven, four of my brothers, two of my sisters, all big Yankee fans. So I had to tell them, you know, yeah, oh, of course I like the Yankees in the American League, but I like the Dodgers in the National Leagues just to stay healthy. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, Mickey was something. Did you first meet Mickey when you were a kid or was it after you made the major leagues? Uh, major leagues when I, I think might've been the, well, he was at first base. So when I, I finally got a hit, I think, uh, I think Whitey Ford was pitching by the way. So I went down to first base and I wanted to say hello, but you know, I was saying, I'm, I'm so nervous. This is my idol. I'm right next to him. I can't believe this. So I take a lead, you know, and uh, it's ball one, come back, take a, a lead, ball two. I says, two and oh, I know the hitter's going to probably get a pitch to hit. Should I say hello? So I was just about, and Mickey turns around and says, hey, Rico, how you doing? How, are you, how you been? How's the family? <laughs> I said, hey, Mick, uh, that's all right, buddy. I uh, feel great. How are you doing? Oh, man alive. I tell you, I was so nervous. What a thrill. What a thrill to be alongside him. <laughs> Did that relax you when he addressed you? Oh, man, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. You know, he knew. He knew. The, they knew the players, the young players that were coming up. Of course, you know, when you play a team, you go through all the, all the players and uh, sometimes even their backgrounds, but to what they're doing at that particular time. And Mick was always, uh, you know, even when he had, when he was real bad, his legs were real bad. He, he was at such great power that he was such a dangerous hitter that you know, he was going to do something. <laughs> I'm looking at his photo now, man, the kid from Oklahoma. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned that you had a little conversation there at first base, and yet that was an era, the 1960s, when players didn't really talk to each other a lot on the field. Absolutely. So this was kind of an exception of the rule. Yeah, and I didn't care because even if they find me, what do I care? I got to say, I, I, Mickey Mantle said my name. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's my <Yeah>. idol. <laughs> so, yeah, you. but right. you're right. You couldn't. You weren't supposed to talk to the opposition. <laughs> uh. One of the many cards that is featured in your book is the card. Uh, well, there's a couple of cards that we see here. Um, one of them is, I believe, a, a Bowman uh, Mickey Mantle card. Um, you have other cards, though, that are featured for Mickey, and we'll talk about uh, one of those in a moment. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about Sandy Koufax, because chronologically, this is one of the earlier cards in the book. The top left, we see the 1955 Sandy Koufax card, which is a pretty valuable card these days. You would never have obviously faced Sandy in a regular season. Uh, you never met in the World Series. Uh, did you face him in spring training at all? 
Faced a lot in spring training. Vero Beach, we were over at Winter Haven, and we were going to play the Dodgers. And, uh, oh, my goodness, Drysdale or Koufax. But, you know, early on, uh, most of the great pitchers, and, and most pitchers trying to get the ball over the plate, so you'll see probably see more hitting. But then when you get towards the, towards the beginning of the season, now they were – throwing like they would throw during the season and you know we'd face Koufax and and uh, Drysdale certainly at that time as well and Sandy was I mean he had a curveball that was well the rotation on it you could hear the spin and it just went bang right straight down 12 12 to 6 and he had that big leg kick as well so he hit the ball uh, and he, he had the fastball. I mean, he's a you know, middle nineties guy and, and finally great control as a kid. I remember reading about him, the Dodgers, the Dodgers were working. They signed him. They were working at Ebbets field on his control. He had, he was so wild that the, some people thought he would never make it, but what a class guy. Uh, you know, we did some golf tournaments, some events with him and he really is, is he's a class person. Uh, and, uh, uh, he had, he had a great attitude. He never, never got mad. I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> Play baseball. But he was, if you hit him, you know, there would, he had some days where he got hit. You know, I, I really respected pitchers like that. Catfish was like that. And a, a number of others, you know, where if they got beat, they got hit around. You never hear complaint, never blame anybody else. he yeah, get you the next time. Rico, with him having two pitches that were so elite, fastball and curveball, did you have to guess? Did you have to look specifically for one or the other to have any kind of a chance? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you, if you were just looking for one pitch uh, and you got uh, the curveball, let's say, looking for fastball, and he'd throw both. So you would, you would get your, say, fastball. Uh, and that's the pitch you wanted to hit because it's, it's his curveball. Yeah. Uh, it was just incredible. Uh, so yeah, you know, so you go after his fastball and what do you do? You pop up, you miss it. You know, the guy had, the guy was incredible. I mean, I, I know the young, some of the young pitchers of today, they throw 97, nine, even a hundred. Uh, but Sandy had, you know, was more than one pitch. Plus he learned how to be a pitcher and not just a thrower. We all know that his teammate, Don Drysdale liked to throw up and in. <laughs> what about Sandy? Did he pitch inside? Uh, yeah, he pitched inside, but he never had to. He never had to knock anybody down. Never. Yeah, he just uh, you know he threw strikes. Uh, he was he was just so tough to hit. I mean, he had a lot of strikeouts, obviously. Uh, but if he stayed healthy and kept going, uh, this guy probably would have won three hundred games. Yeah. That was great. Let's go back to uh, to Mantle for just a moment. You see the iconic 1952 uh, tops card on the right side. I'm sure you're aware it was just a few months ago it was during the winter that one of these 1952 mantles sold at auction for about $5.2 million. Yes. Um, that is the highest price card ever. It beat the Hannes Wagner T206 record, which was about 3.2, 3.3 million dollars. I'm curious, did you collect baseball cards when you were growing up in the in the 50s? Well, every time somebody mentions Mickey Mantle's 52 card, my knees start knocking and I get I feel faint. I need uh need some smelling salts <laughs> because I had a 52 mantle when I got that card. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> Mickey, you know, he's a rookie <clears throat> and he had come up before a little bit, and uh, now he's he just he was just something about him. He, he, everybody loved him. Yes, I had a 52 Mickey card, like a schlemiel, like a jerk. I'm flipping up against the wall. We put it in the, in, in the spokes of the bike like everybody else. And next thing I know, you know, I, I kept it, put it in a box. And this is the truth, like a lot of other people. We moved, and my, my parents threw the box away with all these, all these great cards. Mm. And then when I yeah. started doing the show with Tom, found out the first time one of his cards was sold was for a million one. And I, I just, I want to faint. Oh, 
<laughs> but uh, you know, just having the card was great. <laughs> Touching yeah. it. You know, it's interesting. Tops had actually tried a set one year before 1951, and it was an abject failure. It really flopped. It did not sell well. Uh, but then Cy Berger, uh, executive with Tops, went back to the drawing board uh, in 1952. Uh, his artistic director at Tops, Woody Gelman, helped him design uh, this yeah. iconic set. And of course, the mantle card is really the elite card uh, that comes out of that set. Uh, 1952, hard to believe it has been so many years. Um, here we see a picture of Rico early in his career, sometime in the 1960s. I want to talk, Rico, about your playing days because they were pretty darn significant. Your first major league at bat comes against a guy named Lee Stang. I believe he was pitching for the Minnesota Twins, and it was a good first at bat. What do you remember about it? Well, I think the first at bat, I hit a ground ball, I think. Uh, but, uh, I think it was the second at bat. Now Lee, Lee, did, uh, he didn't have a, a great fastball, uh, but he could he could move it around. But he had an excellent curveball, and so you know here comes the curveball, one then a little sinker, then the next pitch was a hanging curveball, and I hit it towards left field in the uh, on the fly, and I'm running down the first. The coach says keep going, and I'm just I, I had my head down and. Come into second base with one of those pop-up slides. I'm looking around. I said, where's the ball? <laughs> so it went off the wall. Oh, about we had about 3,000 people there, and they were all cheering, and I got the ball. I still have the ball. But what a thrill. You know, what a thrill. The first hit, it's just it's special. It really is special. And uh, ironically, I hit it off the wall where I would play the next uh, the next uh, 12 years and uh, try to continue to hit hit that wall. So it was a big thrill for me, uh, Bruce. That's interesting. You didn't follow the ball. You didn't see it hit the wall. You just put your head down and I ran. Just, which I, whoop, yep. The yeah, old-fashioned way to do it, yeah. Let's I, talk a yeah. little bit about the, the monster, the wall at Fenway. Was it something that altered your swing? Did, did, it, did it get into your head in any way as far as wanting to be more of a pull hitter? Or did you just try to approach it as if it were any other ballpark no you know as a kid in uh, coming up uh, the reminders and all i was pretty much uh, not a dead pull hitter but i would hit hit balls get hits the right center field also home couple of home runs that way uh, as well in the minors but then when i when i first came up i tried switch hitting that didn't work and pete runnels was the batting coach and he was a terrific hitter throughout his career, yeah. Pete, second baseman. <clears throat> we went out there one day early before any game. And uh, he says, let's take a look at Fenway Park. He says, uh, what's a down right field line? Well, 290, Pesky's pole. Then you go out 380. Then you keep going. Then it goes out to towards 420 right center. That means between 380 and 420, it's probably 390, almost 400. So <laughs> we come around. And then the wall, this is the wall. It says 379. Hmm. Come down straight away left, 365. And then, of course, down the line, 310. He says, what would you rather go for, the <laughs> right field or left field? I says, well, Mr. Runnels, I think left field. <laughs> he says, right. That's what you're going to do. You're going to play 81 games here. If you have a long career, that's a lot of games. So he got me on the plate, opened up a little bit. And, you know, I could reach the outside pitch and I, I started hitting that way, you know, and uh, which really made sense to me because even though hurt on the road uh, somewhat, uh, you know, at Fenway Park, I got to play 81 games here a year and, uh, you know, take advantage of the wall. So I became a pretty much a, a pull hitter, right center field, center field was more my straightaway type of uh, hits, you know, and I wanted yeah. to go up the middle. So. Rico, I'm curious about your, your swing approach. We hear a lot today about the launch angle. When I was growing up, we just called it an uppercut swing. How were you taught in the 1960s and even earlier in the 1950s? Were you taught a slight uppercut, a level swing? What was the emphasis at that time? When I first uh, came up through the minor leagues, Nobody bothered you. Uh, we had uh, Eddie Papowski was a manager, and he there was no pitching coach, no hitting coach, and he'd take batting practice and swing, swing, keep your head on the ball, you know, that type of stuff. 
Then we got to the big leagues. Uh, and uh, when Bobby Orr uh, got the job as a, uh, as the hitting coach with Dick Williams, he started talking about not the uppercut, but he said, it's a level swing, but he says, hit down on the ball, hit down yeah. on the ball, wherever your stance is, you hit down on the ball, throw those hands out. And, you know, at first it was a little difficult to adjust, but after a while, you know, we really started getting into the technical stuff. The, the bat stayed in the strike zone uh, longer as opposed to the uppercut swing, which, mm. you know, the only way you hit that ball is perfect timing, which Ted Williams had. Now, yeah. Ted said 10%. You guys should have a little 10%. I don't agree with them that, uh, in what their uh, the theory is today of the uppercut swing. I think, and I know, uh, I had it. Carl Yastrzemski had, he had 44 home runs with it. I had 40 home runs with Bobby, uh, Bobby Dorb being the down, the down swing and Ken yeah. Harrelson, the Hawk in 68 hit 35 homers, 118 RBI. We had our best years. And <clears throat> as time went by, you know, we had, uh, we stuck with it and, and they made changes of course. And then there's different theories, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind there'd be better contact now. There'll still be home runs. And, you know, uh, Bruce, the home run guys, there's probably every team, maybe three guys, right? The middle three guy, the number four or five guy, they're going to have that little upper source up, uppercut swing like Judge of the Yankees and some of the other big hitters mm -hmm. throughout the both leagues. And, okay, yeah, they're going to strike out, but it's all the rest that maybe hit 10, 15 home runs and they got that big swing. Well, it doesn't make sense. doesn't yeah. make sense. So anyway, yeah, I do not agree with it. The uppercut, they can have all the statistics they want that uh, you put the ball in play in the air, that it's better. All right. Uh, that's, I just don't agree with it. Well, if current trends can continue, they may have to change because we see batting averages plummeting and strikeouts rising. Of course, pitching has something to do with that, but there are other factors as well. Rico, in 1965, you become the Red Sox starting shortstop. Uh, your first manager, or one of your early managers, was a guy named Billy Herman. Mm -hmm. He did not treat you very well. You did not really get along. But things then changed when this guy, Dick Williams, comes around in 1967. <laughs> what was it about Dick Williams? What was different about him compared to somebody like Herman? Well, Billy, Billy was uh, a great guy. I mean, uh, but he, he really wasn't, uh, it wasn't, he, he liked to manage the, the uh, veterans more, the older guys, you know, that's what the Red Sox mm. were doing. They were sticking with older guys and they, you know, didn't have great range and, uh, weren't bad hitters, but you know, just weren't winning. They just weren't winning. And then when Dick Williams came on the scene, of course, he had all the young guys, Reggie Smith and uh, George Scott, all, all those players, the young players, plus us, that the guys that were in the major leagues, myself, Jim Lomborg, Dalton Jones, even Yaz was, you know, pretty young. And <clears throat> Dick, you know, he, he had, uh, he had, uh, he could adjust to the young players, you know, he was a disciplinarian. So the young guys, you know, we wanted to win. And so whatever he said, and he brought, he brought not only a great attitude, but he, he brought a different brand of baseball than the, the Red Sox and the Red Sox fans. We used to, it was going to be a little more national league baseball, let the home runs take care of themselves do the fundamentals, the Dodger organization, especially at that time, were really the best fundamental team in baseball. And that's what they taught. And Williams went through their system and yeah. he says, bunts, we're going to hit and run. We're going to hit the cutoff man. And he says, we're going to, we're going to, you know, start winning here. We're tired of losing. And we had kids, you know, kids, like, all, we were all young and we thought, well, maybe we'll go from last next to last to fifth you know, with 10 teams and who knew, who knew in 67 that all of a sudden with a four team race that we would be right in the mix and it didn't happen right away. All the things that he talked about, we got better. You know, we, we started doing the thing, getting bunts down, good hit and run, stealing bases. And, uh, it, it really, uh, 
while we won 10 games in a row uh, before and after the, uh, the all-star break. And that put us right up there. And it came to the last day. What a year. That was, uh, that was yeah. so exciting to be on that team. We're going to talk more about 67 in a moment. I'm curious about Dick's attitude towards 25 man roster. Did he treat everybody the same? Were there the same rules for the utility guys as there were for the superstars? Yeah, absolutely. There, there was. And in 67, when Dick came on the scene, uh, myself and Yaz, you know, we had, uh, I had gone through two years, 65, it came up hundred losses, 60, uh, 66, 99 losses. We were so tired of losing. And now we had, you know, a different bunch of guys, new manager, uh, and with a different attitude and different style of play, we were all for it. Yaz says, Hey, I'll bunt. If you want me to bunt to Williams <laughs> and Williams took the captaincy away from Yaz, which actually helped Yaz. You know, he took the responsibility off his shoulders and he said, just go out and play, you know, play and, uh, and cost Yaz. He started hitting home runs. What a year, the triple crown. So, yeah, it was a, it was a special year. You mentioned Yaz. Here's a great photo from that 67 season. And I, I'm guessing this is from when the, the last day of the season when you clinched the pennant. I don't think it's during the World Series. No, but uh, you you've lost your shirt in this photo. Oh yeah, jeez. Uh, Yaz is in the middle. Reggie on the right. I don't know if I've ever seen three guys, three baseball players, genuinely as happy as they are in this <laughs> photograph. You must remember this day. Oh yeah, I'll never forget it. And uh, we had one. We had uh, listening to the radio because Detroit, if they win the doubleheader from the Angels, then it's tie. And uh, we got to play, uh, have a playoff game, which would have been at Fenway. And uh, they won the first game, and then the second game they lost. So the place went nuts. The the uh, clubhouse. I mean, guys were just so ecstatic, and everybody hugging Yaz because he had such a great year. I mean, he really carried us uh, offensively. And then Jim Lomborg winning the Cy Young Award. He was a, a top pitcher, and but just the. You know, it's just a great, all young players coming up through the organization together. We knew each other, you know, when we went to spring trainings. And uh, so we were all friends and it was, uh, it was terrific. Wish I would have shaved my chest. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let that go without comment. <laughs> okay. uh, let's talk more about Yaz. I've always heard that Carl Yastrzemski was an incredibly hardworking athlete. He had you know, this work ethic that was almost unparalleled, not only among the Red Sox players, but among players across both leagues. Talk about having a guy like that in the clubhouse, in the dugout with you day after day. Yeah. Oh, he was great. Great teammate. Uh, and you talk about working hard. I mean, uh, the ground crew, uh, <laughs> I think they tried to go home early a few times just so Yaz wouldn't want to want them to get the cage, the batting cage, after a night game from center field. And sure enough, here he goes. He gets three hits, three for four, three for five, and he's not happy. He wants a hit after the game. Boom, he goes, you know, he's so he, he – I don't know, probably hit 40 minutes of batting practice. He worked so hard at it. Uh, he had a beautiful swing. I mean, uh, uh, you know, he had it all, really. And, uh, yeah, he his work ethic was tremendous, and uh, it paid off, of course. And then that uh, the uh, winter of 67, you know, January, well, actually before that, the winter of 66, he went into a training program that really helped him get stronger, and in even better shape. And they carry that over into 67 with the extra batting practice, always worked on, you know, the ball coming off the wall, a lot of practice, a lot of practice. And that's why we say, you know, you have to, you want to get to the big leagues, you better put in extra time because if you don't, uh, you know, you know it's just, it may not work. Yeah. But he was tremendous. I would think communication with him was especially important because, you know, you're playing shortstop. He's right behind you in left field. And at Fenway Park, those two positions are pretty close together. So there yeah. had to be a lot of talking during the game. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, sometimes they're trying to signal him the pitch. You know, if it's a changeup, right-handed hitter, he he might hit the ball to the left side. So uh, we'd have a little little signal once in a while. But there's one time I remember because we were we were very good friends. So uh, there would be pop-ups, right? High pop-ups. I, I I never forget one was with Killebrew. So <clears throat> here goes the ball goes way up. I start back pedaling a, a little bit, and I'm saying I know Yaz is going to get this. And all I hear is out there, you got it, you got it. I says, oh my god, I went all the way out. So I said, oh, he wants to, be, he wants to save a little bit here, and you know, his legs. So next time something like that happens, I don't move. I just turn around, and says, you got it, you got it. And yeah. we started started kidding each other about it, but yeah, he was he was a fun guy. He was just uh, great in the clubhouse too. You still keep in touch with guys like Yaz and Reg, uh, Reggie Smith all these years later? Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, I just talk with Reggie and uh, Jim Lomberg is around. Mike Andrews, uh, of course, a lot of guys who uh, have passed away, but uh, we still have guys, and uh, we we get together, you know. Uh, we reminisce about it and realize that we were uh, we were in a special year for the Boston Red Sox, even though we didn't win the World Series. But uh, it was a special year. Brought the fans back for sure. Yeah. Here's a great baseball card that came out as part of the 1968 top set, but it's about game six of that memorable 67 World Series. You were very quiet in the first five games and then all all of a sudden you bust out two home runs. Uh, at Fenway Park, you lead the Red Sox to an eight to four victory. That game, I guess, probably has to stand out. Maybe as the, the single greatest game of your career. Well, uh, to it. yeah, I mean, being in the World Series, absolutely. Uh, you know, I was I was struggling. There was a guy named uh, Bob something that pitched twice against. Uh, I think it was Bob Gibson. Uh, one of the all-time greats, <laughs> and I didn't do much against him. So, anyway, it was nice. Uh, I caught a couple of pitches. You see in that picture that, you know, a lot of people don't even know who the catcher was. I get asked for autographs. I said, you know who the catcher is? Oh, no, who's that? Tim McCarver. Yep. Cardinals, come on. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. And I've never seen Tim's name on, you know, one of the cards that I get, but people, I think, they just don't remember. But anyway – he was, you can see he was, his glove was outside. They tried to pitch me away. Yeah. And I fortunately uh, got into the ball a little bit and hit it good. So it was a couple of home runs, which was a thrill. We had to win that game. So to, to get to the next game. So I was, I was glad I was a part of it. Yeah. You mentioned that great Cardinals pitching staff headline by Gibson. How much of a factor was your, your early struggles could be placed on the fact that, you know, it was your first World Series. You're still a young, young player, maybe a bit nervous. Was that a part of it as well? No, nah, the first game, you know, we were all a little nervous, uh, excited. Uh, we knew Gibson, how great he was, you know, and actually we probably faced them in, we did. Uh, they were in St. Pete at the time. We faced them in spring training. Not much, uh, but, uh, you know, it was, we know we knew about him, of course, but, uh, he was, he was incredible. I mean, I struck out my first game against him. The first game was four times, four times in a row. And I think I fouled one pitch off against him. and he just moved the ball around. He had, you know, upper nineties, uh, uh, with his fastball had a great slider change up. I mean, it was just a great athlete. He moved the ball around, you know, and we knew about him, you know, not being afraid to throw inside, but no one worried about it because we figured it was the world series and no, you know, they, nobody wanted any trouble, uh, but he didn't have to because we didn't hit very much of him. A couple of guys hit home runs, but uh, yeah, he was tough. He was tough. Cardinals had some other good pitchers at the time. Uh, the late Nellie Bryles was yeah. a very effective right-hand pitcher. That's right. uh, there was a young Steve Carlton also at that time. So this was, uh, this was a, a hallmark pitching staff in, in many ways. What was oh, the crowd good. reaction like at Fenway in those serious games? Was, was the atmosphere different from anything you'd ever experienced? Yes, actually, in, in Boston, in my early years, uh, fans would mostly clap, you know, go hit a home run, hey, yes, hit a, you know, until 67. 
And then they started going whack because we had an exciting team in the World Series. That was it was incredible. I mean, fans in Boston were jumping all over the place. You know what I mean? Screaming, really rooting for the team. Not not so much. Uh, well, yeah, after you did something, say a home run, but even before that, they were trying to you know trying to help you uh, to to get a hit or to win this ball game. So they were great. But early on in my career, you know, they of course they didn't have very much to yell about. You lose a hundred games and then ninety nine, but but they yeah they were great and, and uh, really excited about us. A lot of people point to sixty seven as really the beginning of Red Sox Nation, uh, which is a term that um, had not really been heard of, uh, you yeah. know, prior to that time period. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about you as an individual player. I, Maybe younger fans don't realize how good you were. You were a two-time All-Star. You hit 40 home runs as a shortstop in 1969. You hit 210 home runs over a 13-year career. Three times you received consideration for the American League MVP award. So you have that great season in 69, 40 home runs. You then play 1970, uh, again as the starting shortstop. But then after the season, the Red Sox are closing in on a deal for another veteran shortstop and a guy named Luis Aparicio. And I understand that you got a call about the possibility of moving to third base to accommodate that particular player. Uh, who made that call? How'd that conversation go? Well, Eddie Casco made the call and actually uh, they were, they were actually looking, at least they told us that, you know, they're going to go look for a third baseman. And there was really no one available. They, they talked about uh, getting Ron Santo from the Cubs. Cubs weren't going weren't to let him go. And then they get this opportunity with uh, uh, Louis Aparicio. Louis was available, and uh, they figured if I would move over to third, they can get a couple of years out of Louis for, and have our next Red Sox prospect come up after that. And uh, when Eddie said, you know, would you move over to third? You're probably going to do it eventually anyway. And I says, Eddie, hey, with Louis Aparicio, I mean, he's, you know, he's a great shorts. I said, absolutely. I says, you know, I just want to be in the lineup. Uh, I'd be happy to move over. And, and that was it. They got uh, Louis. He came on the team. He was terrific, great teammate. And he could still play. Had some trouble hitting, uh, you know, because I think he went 0 for 44 one time. Uh, it was tough on him and everybody, you know, felt bad for him, but, uh, yeah, I learned to play thanks to Frank Malzon, uh, who was a great third baseman for the Red Sox. And he helped me out at third base positioning and, uh, boy, that ball came down there fast though. What a difference, you know, you, you couldn't see the ball at shortstop. You could see the ball coming in the home plate and the bat hitting it at third base. It was just the swing and bang. There it was. And boy, some of those big hitters with the top spin, Frank Howard, Frank Robinson, Killebrew. Oh, man. I mean, if you didn't hold that ball in your glove, it would spin out of your glove. But boy, yeah. with power, tremendous. You know, some people might think, well, shortstop to third base, that shouldn't be too hard a transition. Third base sounds like it might be less demanding. But then you think about players like Jim Fragosi. He tried to make that switch for the Mets. Did not work out at well at all. He struggled mightily. Uh, yeah. The ball does get to you quicker. Uh, there's different responsibilities. You have to cover a different base, third base as opposed to second base. So this was not a routine adjustment by any stretch. Oh, no, uh, not at all. Uh, you know, I, I knew there was going to uh, – There'd be work, a lot of work to be done, especially in the bunts. Uh, and you'd get players who could bunt and who had power, like Paul Blair uh, for the Orioles. Paul, you had to play in, uh, you know, and if you played in, he swung away, hit your way. You know, I mean, it was tough to get to that ball. And there were others like him. So, yeah, there was an adjustment. And the throw, the throw is different also. I mean, there's – Bount, the bounces are different because of that spin. And so you had to do a lot of do or die jobs, you know, pick that ball up and be running in and pick it up and then throw it underhand. So, yeah, uh, it, it was different. As we move into the early 70s, uh, another Hall of Famer emerges, a guy named Carlton Fisk. Uh, he actually made his debut a couple of years earlier, but 72 was his first full season. 
Uh, here he is, the six foot four inch catcher. Most catchers not that tall. Uh, <laughs> carries himself in a very distinctive way. Uh, highly intelligent guy. Tell us about your first impressions of Carlton Fisk. Yeah, well, the first impressions were spring training. <clears throat> Not sure exactly what, what year, but anyway, he's catching. And I'm telling you that he, in one inning, I, he must have had three pass balls, balls that he, you know, he just, I just, and hitting, he struggled. I says, this is the, this is the catcher of the future. Oh man, alive. He's a big, strong kid, but I don't know. He goes back to the minor leagues and comes up in September. And I couldn't believe it It was the same guy polished blocking balls, hitting better. I mean, wow. Uh, You know, (laughs) he really improved. And from that, you know, time on, he went on uh, to have a great career, be a hall of famer. Uh, But yeah, he, uh, Louis T used to call him Frankenstein because he, you know, he had that look. He looked like he had the bolts in his neck. And he was upright, and he got a lot of uh, opposition players mad. They thought he was, you know, a little arrogant, but he wasn't. I mean, he was a great competitor. Oh, he get on pitchers, boy. He get he really get on them. Uh, and he was the one thing, like Munson. Him and Munson had a rivalry, but both of them were great clutch hitters. Boy, Fisk. The 60, you know, the 75 World Series, but during the year, I mean, this guy would come up with big hits all the time. And uh, it was just a terrific all around player uh, and deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Featured in the book is his 1972 Tops card, which he shared with a, a pretty good player, Cecil Cooper. Yeah, and then a right hand pitcher who ended up being a journeyman in the 1970s, Mike Garman. I have to admit, I've never heard about the Frankenstein Fisk reference. <laughs> he must not have been thrilled about that. Oh, he laughed. Louis Tion had names for all of the guys. Oh, you can call me salami. I said, well, salami, how do you get that? He said, you know, the big attack <laughs> you eat. <laughs> I said, okay, Louis. <laughs> he, was, he was great. Yeah. yeah uh, Fisk. Uh, we had a chance to interview him last year, as a matter of fact. So yeah. uh, we, had, we had a good time with Louis Tion on this yeah, program. Uh, another card featured in the book, another Hall of Famer, is, of course, uh, Rich Goose Gossage. This is his 1974 Tops card, which I believe was the second card that came out for him. His rookie came out in 73. So, yeah. Rico, you faced Goose early on. He was a starter at one point with the White Sox. Exactly. Then yeah. became a reliever. What do you remember about facing the young Goose? Yeah, I remember. That's right. He was a starter coming on. Uh, the White Sox had, uh, and I brought up some pretty good pitchers. They could really throw goose was a little wild. Uh, he had, uh, you know what they say, a heavy ball and one of the best tailing sinkers that I've seen. I mean, the, he'd break your bat. We used to take extra bats to Chicago when we go face him and a few other p- pitchers that they had that could th- really throw. But goose said, uh, he was a great competitor. Uh, he had that that fastball, a sinker that ran in, little slider, but he won mostly with the sinker, moving in and out, and uh, was he just kept coming at you. You know, he he was that type of pitcher that was really a challenge. You know, he come at you like you know, and you have to get into the batter's box and do the same thing, uh, but tough to hit, tough to make good contact on him. You know, if he and don't forget he. As a closer, he didn't pitch one inning. I mean, he pitched three innings, four yeah. innings. Yeah. You know, by the fourth inning, you know, he, may, he might give up a home run or something, but he, he closed so many games. Uh, <clears throat> if he pitched one inning like they do now, I mean, he'd still be pitching, first of all. <laughs> uh, I mean, he was big and strong and uh, great competitor. Yeah, he was tough. He was. Tough. I got to talk with him uh, at events. Uh, it's a number of events afterwards as well. And, uh, yeah, he is not very happy the way things are going now in baseball because, uh, you know, he's from the old school and he pitched three innings. These guys only pitch in one inning. And, uh, sometimes they come in with, uh, you know, there were three runs ahead, but they still get the opportunity to be, you know, to close the game, uh, a lot easier, but, uh, you know, that's, that's because he was such a great competitor. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it wasn't fun facing him. I want to tell you. Yeah. 
Rico, I remember him later in his career when he was with the Yankees primarily, and he had a very strange motion. It was all arms and legs. He kind of threw his body toward you. I don't know if he was like that early on with the White Sox. If he was, I that was not a comfortable motion to face. No, he had that full wind-up, which you don't see very often now. You know, going up and down, and then the legs come and all that, and here comes the glove. And then, you know, you got a 95-mile-an-hour mile tailing fastball, uh, and it's in on your hands. I mean, you really – if you you got to lay off it. This, I got a couple of hits off him, off you know, uh, on the hands, uh, but tough to get the meat part of the bat on it. You know, yeah. especially when that first thing when he came in, hey, it was tough. Now, it was, it was uh, again, you know, these guys, they were all in the Hall of Fame and they deserve it. Hall of Famers don't have, you know, it's not one or two, three years. It's just about every year they continue to do it. They're special. They're, they're talented uh, <clears throat> and they pretty much deserve being in the Hall of Fame. And he certainly does. Yeah. As we move into the mid seventies, uh, another hall of famer becomes prominent with the Red Sox young player, uh, by the name of Jim Rice. We can see his, uh, 1975 tops rookie card in the upper left. And then a closer look at it here. He shares it with, uh, Dave Augustine, Pepe Mangual and John Scott. Uh, those three didn't work out quite as well for them, but of course, Rice emerges as a hall of fame, slugger you got to play with him uh as he's just coming up by now you're the vested veteran on that 75 ball club i'm curious what that was like you have these young guys coming up yeah. a jim rice a carlton fist a few years earlier do you kind of see in them where you were about a dozen years earlier oh absolutely i mean you know one thing about uh, jim and freddie they were not like wise Wise guys coming up, you know, uh, knowing it all and that. No, they were, they were humble. I mean, they were, you know, they asked questions, uh, and uh, we knew they were going to be the future. Uh, yeah. Rice had great numbers in the minors. Freddie maybe not as high, but you know, he was going to be a center fielder. Rice was going to be the left fielder, and uh, <clears throat> then when they finally made the team, we went into the '75 season, both rookies, and bang, right from the start. Oh, wow. Yeah, clutch hitting. Fred was just a great outfielder and he could hit the ball to all fields. And the big thing was that they were both clutch hitters. They knocked in runs. I think both of them knocked in over a hundred runs in this, their first yeah. year. I mean, that was incredible. That picked up. The, I mean, that really helped us. Uh, although we had some other good hitters, there's no doubt, but man, a lot these kids was something else. And it was just fun, fun seeing them. Jim Rice, I'm going to tell you now that he would have had probably 50 more home runs if he played in a different ballpark. Mm. He hit so many line drives off that wall going up. Really, no exaggeration. So the other guys will tell you the same thing. He would have had well over 400 home runs. Uh, and uh, uh, he was such a good hitter that uh, – you know, that, that MVP year was incredible. Uh, and I see him, I actually see Jim. Uh, he's doing some broadcasting here in Boston for Nesson and a uh, great golfer. He's a heck of a golfer. I hear he could hit a drive longer than just about anybody on the pro tour back in the day. <laughs> 340, 350, yeah. 330. You know, I played once, uh, one time with him when, uh, years ago, and uh, I'm playing with him, and he hits a ball towards the woods. It's about 170 yards. He takes out a wedge, and I'm saying, well, what are you doing, Jim? He says, what? He says, you got a wedge. What are you, crazy? You're not going to reach it. <laughs> he yeah. turns and I left, bang, on the green. I says, that's it. I'm done. Hey, anybody want to buy a set of clubs here? I, yeah. I mean, it's just tremendous. Now, he ends up missing the 1975 series because of injury. Yeah. And I know it's, it's always tempting to, to look back and think what might have happened. You think the series could have turned out differently if Jim Rice is there for you? It could have. You know he would have done something. I mean, it, it hit a few home runs, knock in a few runs, I would think. Maybe that's all it would have taken. But unfortunately, 
You know, he gets hit in the wrist, breaks his wrist. It breaks that pitch, breaks his wrist, and no Jim Rice. 67, no Tony Canigliaro. So, you know, we don't know. We played a great – 75, we played a great uh, <clears throat> Cincinnati team. I mean, a lot of Hall of Famers. And so we don't know what would have happened. But uh, it would have been nice having him for sure, you know. Uh, <laughs> and and, and – uh, uh, he was just, and he went on. He just continued having some great years and learn how to play that wall. I will tell you, you talk about work. This yeah. guy worked Johnny Pesky every day, every day on the road, um, at home, hitting balls off that. And he became outstanding out there. I want to talk about one more hall of famer who's featured in the book. Another great right-hand hitter, great defensive third baseman as well. Uh, Mike Schmidt. Solheim in spring training, not in the regular season. Uh, a guy that I had a, the privilege of watching pretty much from the start of his career to the end of his career. And really a player, when he was fully formed as a player, really had no weaknesses at all. Great. Maybe, maybe the best all-around third baseman uh, ever. <laughs> because he could do it all. I mean, he was a great fielder, great range, excellent arm, and, man, he can hit. Now, I've talked with him. Jim Jim Woods and I did the game of the week on USA Cable years ago. We went to Philadelphia about three times. Mike was a young hitter, came up, and uh, there was two outs in the ninth inning. They were losing one nothing. the Phillies, and he's on third base, and he tries to steal home. With two outs, bottom. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, we're like, Mike, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know why he went and he's out. And, uh, you know, he gets ripped the next day. And it's, uh, but the big thing, we had the opportunity of talking to him uh, afterwards also. You know, we talked about that hitting uh, theory. Now he had that uppercut. He struck out a lot early on. And then, he says, I went to that hitting down on the ball. Hmm. If I, he said the last number of years that he played, he did that. If he didn't do that, he said, he would not have hit 500 home runs. It's 500 home runs. He started because they were pitching him up and he was missing. And then finally, I don't know if somebody told him or what, what it was. He started getting on top of the ball and even balls say, in between the waist and, and the knees, you could still hit down on the ball and that ball will go up. Okay. And he did it and he hit over, well, you know, 500 home runs. And I, I was like in, I was in seventh heaven. Oh, Mike, that's great. He said the same yeah. thing. We got, I got to talk to you about more about that. And that, that's what he believed. And, uh, but he was a great player, really great player. Uh we have a few minutes remaining with former Red Sox standout Rico Petroselli. We do want to take questions from the folks in the audience. He says, hi, Bruce. Hi, Rico. Rico, you were my favorite player as a kid when I played shortstop. I grew up wow. in Brooklyn, played Little League at Gil Hodges' South Highway Little League. Yeah. I met your brother who was a policeman. He was stationed outside the synagogue I went to on Avenue Z. Yep. near Coney Island Avenue, thanks to the presentation. I remember wow. the area. Yes. Good memory there. Oh, uh -huh. wow. That goes way back. Yeah. PS 206. Hello there, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, it was great growing up at that time there. I had a lot of good friends. We played sports every day. And uh, Sheepshead Bay High School went there. We were the first graduating class. And I have a lot of good memories there. Yep. And learned a lot. Steve, he says, Rico, I had the pleasure of umpiring okay. Little League games for six years with your brother, Tony. This must be another brother. This was in Old Bridge, New Jersey. He was lots of fun. So yeah. another comment there. <laughs> he How was. Many brothers you have four. Yeah, my oldest brother. I had okay. four, four brothers, two sisters. <clears throat> yeah, t uh, my brother, Tony, the, he was the oldest. He helped out. He did a lot for the Little League uh, in Old Bridge, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was very well liked. I mean, he worked hard trying to get sponsors and all that, which is important. Yeah. We want to keep these kids playing, playing baseball. Now it's getting tougher, you know, but, uh, yeah, those were great days. I, I mean, like all kids, they, they all wanted to play baseball 
And so we had a lot of competition and a lot of guys who made the big leagues. Yeah. Rico, one of our regular viewers is Perry Barber, who is an umpire. And she writes in, uh, will you ask Rico when he's coming back to the women's Red Sox camp? We miss him. Well, I was at the first camp and it was a great camp. And it was, uh, I, I tell you, these women could play <laughs> and they were aggressive. And Butch Hobson was the manager there, and I was the coach of that team. And we won the championship. Hmm. And uh, what they did, the Red Sox brought the girls to Fenway Park during the year, gave them rings, beautiful rings, and gave to all of us. Uh, and then they, they do that every year now. And I think they want different players there, you know. Uh, so that's why I went the one year, which was great, and that's it. But I have gone to the to the men's camp uh, almost every year from from the year I uh, from that particular year. So I don't think I'll be there, but uh, I might be there if I go to the other camp and you guys hang around for a while. Maybe I'll see you. All right, very good question from Martin Brody. Uh, he wants to know if Rico can make a few Eric. comments about Tony Canigliaro. Yeah. You are very close to Tony. Talk a little bit about your relationship with him. Very close to Tony and his family, his father and mother. And, uh, of course, his other two brothers, Billy and uh, Richie. Billy made the big leagues. Uh, they would invite us because uh, uh, we stayed, you know, in the winter. And we really didn't have any place to go for Thanksgiving. They would invite us over Thanksgiving, Christmas, had four little kids. And they were wonderful, like a second family to me. And Tony and I, he was a little younger, but we came up almost at the same time with the spring training with the Red Sox, big league camps, got to know him better. We had some laughs, uh, naturally being from uh, <clears throat> from the Italian background, we had a lot in common there. Uh, and so it was it's just great, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll tell you, Right from day one, coming out of high school, he was a fearless hitter. Went down to spring training, had the the best spring training I've ever seen in a guy. Line drives, home runs, one after another, and he got everybody so excited. Johnny Pesky was the manager. Johnny wanted to bring him up. Mike Higgins, who was the general manager at the time, he and like Billy Martin, they wanted to go with veterans. But finally, John got his way and got Tony to the big leagues. 70, was it, uh, and what was it, 64? Anyway, Tony had a great year, you know, for a young kid. And he went on and he was just fearless hitter. And, and because of that, I think it's why he got hit more. Because that inside pitch, he, he, would, he wouldn't move, you know. And if it was a strike, well, I'll tell you, he just... He, he nailed it. Uh, you couldn't throw inside by him. But if it was inside a couple of inches, he didn't move because I thought he had a blind spot. And when he got hit yeah. in 67, I was on deck, and I saw that, just the ball coming up there by his head, and, and bang, hit him right here, right below the eye. I said, oh, my God, I ran up there, saw his face just balloon up blood and then the doctor came the trainers took him away thought he'd never play again made one of the great comebacks in the history of sports that is not talked about enough when he come back he couldn't see he was almost blind in that eye and the scar tissue yeah. developed and he came back incredible and he and he had his first at yeah. bat was in baltimore it's a home run i almost hit my head on the on the uh, the dugout, I, we jumped up so much. Everybody went out of the dugout hugging. The, you know, wow, what a comeback! And I think it was 1970. He came back and yeah, uh, he had a very good year. Unfortunately, his vision began to deteriorate shortly thereafter, and he was not able to really you know recapture that glory. But yeah. uh, he did make a, an incredible comeback. Uh, one final amazing. question: I uh, found a picture. I think this was at your website, Tony. It's the one on the left. And that's with you, 1960s, and that's George Scott, the Boomer. Talk a little bit about Boomer. <laughs> Real close friend. Uh, Boomer and I came up together pretty much. I think he, he came up the next year, but we, we were in the minors. One of the great first basements. Defensively, I mean, all you had to do to throw the ball near, close enough, in the ground, up high, he'd catch it, and it'd be an out. 
I would have had about 75 errors if it wasn't for him. Joe Foy would have had 110 because we th threw the ball in the dirt all the time and he'd scoop it up. <clears throat> and he, he used to say, he says, I should be getting part of your salaries for saving you guys <laughs> 6,000 a year. I don't think he, I could afford it. But the boomer was a great guy, just a great, he loved the game. He didn't care who was pitching. He says, got to throw it over the plate. He says, I got a chance. And he, he wanted to play every day. And he struggled at times. He struggled with his weight at times as a player. Dick Williams kind of disciplined him a few times. Uh, but overall, I mean, great power. Uh, just this was a terrific player. He died too young. I mean, he's just, uh, I think he had uh, uh, some health issues. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just a great friend. We'd have, we have laugh. We had so many laughs together. Yeah, I miss him. Ago, one of the more colorful personalities in the game, loved to refer to home runs as taters. Taters, was, yeah, yeah. And he came up with the kitchen. You got you if you got hit on the hands, you broke it back. He said you got in, got in your kitchen, <laughs> and everybody used it after that too. Yeah, I tell you, he's hit one of the longest home runs I've ever seen off Whitey Ford in the old Yankee Stadium. Ford threw him something. I think it was a breaking pitch, about. Middle uh, between the knees and the waist, Scott hit it. You know the facade. It, the, the the stance went around, not to straightaway center, but to say left center. He hit it up in the third deck in left center field. There was an exit there. He hit it over the exit. I was like Ford. <laughs> Ford says he says I, I says I, you know I gave up the home run, but that that one was incredible. I had to <laughs> I had to give him credit for that. What a home run, man. Yeah. Oh, he got it all. And uh, never forget that. That's how strong he was. <laughs> Some great recollections over this past hour with Rico Petroselli. By the way, that photograph of Rico in the upper right, that is Rico playing the drums, one of his many talents. In fact, I believe he was featured on a, on a major album uh, a few well, decades ago. Yeah, with John Kiley, but it was I didn't even know it was being recorded. But I, uh, you know, I love, I, I like rock. I played the drums for about 25 years and we used to, I used to take sticks on the road. We had a player named Carmen Fanzone who was an excellent trumpet player yeah. and Carmen, he and I would go on the road. We sit in with groups, especially in Washington, Washington, uh, DC, when we played them, there was a lot of jazz, jazz places there and with trios and we'd go in there and talk to the guy, you know, he had his trumpet case. And I had the sticks, was, you know, we were looking to sit in and sure enough, you know, we get the opportunity <laughs> to play some jazz and all that. And it was, it was so much fun. And then I finally gave it up, play a little piano now, but uh, I, yeah, I gave them to my son and he played for a while and then he sold them. And that was that. <laughs> One of the many talents of Rico Petroselli. Would you thank Rico for joining us? Again, you fun. can uh, purchase this book at our website. Go to shop.baseballhall.org and then do a search for Rico Petroselli. Order the book. It'll be an autographed copy. Uh, yes. Beautifully photographed, some really nice recollections, great stories from Rico uh, and his dreams. Rico, thank you. We really appreciate your time. Bruce, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. It's great reminiscing about some of the great players of all time being in the Hall of Fame. Best thank of continued you. luck uh, to you with your radio program and your memorabilia show that you do as well. Uh, it's great thank to you. see that you remain uh, so active. Uh, we do uh, uh, you. wish you the best of luck, and uh, we hope to see you in Cooperstown at some point. Oh, yeah, I'll be there, really. In fact, we got a trip planned sometime this summer. Thank you, Bruce. Very good, Rico. We appreciate it. Thanks also to the Ford Motor Company for their generous support of the program. We hope everybody's enjoyed it. Have a great day, everyone.